Hey guys, we're jumping back in here. If you don't remember where you left off in the last segment or the last part, go ahead and go back and uh, listen to it again, or just if nothing else, listen to the very end of it. So you're kind of keeping in track here. Um, I will include a little bit from the previous uh, the previous episode so that we can stay on track. Otherwise, let's uh, get back into it. See you at the end. Bye. Team one, stand by. Copy, team one, stand by. Breach, breach, breach. Okay, so here we go. Again, talking about that 30 to 20% ratio, talking about the um, talking about the other statistics that we've talked about, the 1,236 deaths in public safety since 2017. Keeping those statistics in mind, okay? Keeping in mind that there's roughly 331.9 million people. This is according to 2021 census. There's roughly 331 million, 331.9 million individuals in the United States. Only 4.8 million of that 331 are first responders work in the public safety community. So 4.8 million people within that 331 million are public safety. Huge, huge difference vastly outnumbered by the general populace. That makes that means 1.4% of the U.S. population. 1.4% of the U.S. population are comprised of those of us in the public safety community. Yet, our rates of suicide are higher. You know, 1, 1,236 since 2017. Um, we have such a smaller, like I said, 1%, not even 1.5% of this population, yet our numbers are so much higher. So much higher. That kind of resonate with you on how important it is, how, how important mental health is in the public safety community. When there's such a vastly smaller group of us, but yet our mental health uh, behavioral behavioral health conditions and things like that pass the the general population numbers by so much. You know, even even if we didn't surpass it, even if we didn't surpass the general population in a lot of these statistics, just being close is enough to warrant you know a red flag. Just being close to the average number is a red flag. 30% of public safety will develop a behavioral health condition versus 20% of the popul the general population. Guys, if it were 20% of the general population and we in public safety was 15%, that's still too much. When you're looking at 1.4% of the U.S. population, even coming close to what's left of the 331.9 million citizens or people inside the U.S., how, how does that number even get close? How can we be such a small portion of our entire population and yet our numbers are so big? Well, this is worth something looking into. This is something worth paying attention to. You know, like I said earlier, it's not just the incidents that we go to. It's not just the scenes we see or the things we hear or anything like that. It's not just that that contributes to it. Critical incidents seem to be the leading cause of the majority of behavioral health conditions among the public safety community. But the research shows that other causes include organizational stress, the stigma surrounding mental health, the lack of mental health literacy, and lack of leadership surrounding mental health. So organizational stress. Those of us in public safety, it's not just the jobs that we have to, to deal with the stress of. And I would venture to say, and this is just an assumption on my part, you know what assumptions can do, but in at least our area of the world, of the country, we have an organizational design just like every other job. 
So we've got individuals that are above us, supervisors and, and things like that. We've got people that are above us. And because of that, you know, the organization has its own stress. Constant changes and the in the winds of the public and the, the winds of uh, societal acceptance and things of that nature, changes in laws, changes in procedures. Um, all of these things create organizational stress. So we're not just dealing with like those of you that work in a typical office that's not public safety, you know, the stresses you go through just because of your organization, your deadlines and, you know, dealing with other employees and things of that nature. We have to deal with that as well. We have to deal with that stress, that organizational stress on top of the stress we experience going to these calls. And it doesn't have to be a major call. I'll tell you from personal experience, it doesn't have to be a a critical incident to cause stress. You know how many people we have to deal with, how many how many uh, personal contacts we make in just a shift, just one shift alone, the personal contacts we make, we are exposed to and deal with a vast number of, of personalities. You know, just last night on shift, dealt with an individual, 22 years old, and looking at him i i'm 21 years older than he is i'm looking at him and he's telling me about the woes in his life and then he immediately changes from someone that's you know wanting and and asking for empathy asking for help to immediately flipping the script and being aggressive you know maybe not so much physically but but verbally, now he's being aggressive. You know, he's he's talking bad. He's he's talking ugly to people, and this, that, and the other. And he's going back and forth, guys. That's that's mentally taxing on individuals. That's mentally taxing on those of us in the public safety community. And it's not just law enforcement, fire department, EMS, corrections, uh, dispatchers. They all deal with it too. You know, I've told you guys I think before that my wife is a, is a nine one one dispatcher. And I've heard the stories from her, how she's on the on the phone with an individual who's called asking for help. And they flip from talking to her normal to the next thing she knows, they're cussing her out because, you know, we don't have some malic, magic uh, teleporter that pops us up at their house. You know, they go from, yes, I need help. I need help. Yes, ma'am, please send them blah, 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 to you need to get them here now and yelling and cussing at her. You know, that's mentally taxing on on her. You know, and she's not the only one. It's everybody in, in the in the public public safety communications. In the dispatcher world, that's all of them. They all deal with that. Fire department, EMS, corrections, they deal with it as well. Those individuals are dealing with the same people I am, the same people that my wife is. You know, they're dealing with these same ones. And that's just taxing. So all of that on top of all the organizational stress, you know, this stuff just starts piling up. You talk about the stigma surrounding mental health. I've talked enough about that. You, you guys understand what I'm talking about, this, the stigma around it. It's, you know, the the fellow employee not trusting. It's the employer not trusting. It's, um, you know, it, it's being seen as weak and not capable of doing your job. It's people worry about it interfering with their advancement. You know, some are looking to to move up the organizational chain. They don't want to be a worker be like that all the time. They want to start moving up so they can make other changes and other differences. So they worry about, you know, letting it be known that they need a little mental health. And just because of the simple fact that they don't want it to stop their forward progression or their upward progression through the organizational chain so that they, they don't say anything. That's a stigma. You know, talking about the lack of mental health literacy. I talk to people all the time that are clueless about things that affect our mental health. You know, they don't, they don't, you know, they know things like depression. They know things like alcoholism, but they don't know anything about PTSD. They don't know anything about um, other mental health aspects, anxiety. You know, they don't know things about this stuff because it's not something that they think about. It's not something that they've been trained in. It's not something they're educated on, something they haven't at least knowingly had experience with. So they're they're ignorant to mental health in general, how to deal with it, how to spot it, how to recognize it, how to how to get help for it. They're ignorant to it. And I'm not saying that to be ugly and mean. I'm not. You know, there's a lot of things in this world I don't know. And I'm ignorant to it. 
you know, it doesn't mean I'm less of an individual. It just means, I don't know. So, you know, we're, we're talking about that lack of mental health literacy, that, that lack of knowledge on what it is and how to deal with and everything like that. And then, of course, the lack of leadership surrounding mental health. And this is this is something that it can be intentional. It can be unintentional. You know, it can be unintentional just because of the, the mental health literacy. You know, our supervisors, our, our leadership in our organizations, again, most of them are the old dogs. They're the ones that are long in the tooth. They're the ones that have been doing this for 20, 30 years. It wasn't a thing for them. So it's not going to be on the forefront of their minds because, well, that's not how they did it when they were on the road doing it, when they were out in the field doing it. Um, so it's different. You know, it could be it could be the literacy. It could be the stigma. You know, oh, well, if anybody in my organization, um, if anybody in my organization can't hack it, you know, they, they have a mental health issue, well, they just don't need to be doing the job. Well, that's, that's an incorrect, you know, this is this is an intentional thing at this point. You know, if you're if you're as a leader in your organization, if you're looking at it as well, they just they just can't be trusted to do their job because X, Y and Z. It's not entirely true. Now, that's not saying there that, that it's not because there are certain situations that can develop or can happen that probably should pull that person back from the front line and maybe look at a back line issue. Um, some may have to leave the 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 organization altogether. It does happen. It does get to that point where things like that are severe enough that that's what needs to happen. But not always. Not the majority. You know, most people that are experiencing these stressors and that are experiencing these uh, behavioral health conditions, they can be helped. They can be made whole. They can be brought back. You know, they can be changed to where now they're helping with the the mental health literacy of your organization. Very close friend of mine knows he's an alcoholic. But because he knows that, because he's he's sought treatment for that, he can speak openly to other individuals, you know, you know, individuals in his even smaller circle of the public safety community. He can speak with them because he's experienced the difference that it can make. He's experienced the relief that it can give him. You know, um, so it, it it all plays into it. And if, and if the leadership in our organizations aren't willing to op be open and accepting and try to help with that, then we're just going to keep kicking the can down the road and we're never going to make a difference. You know, it's like we talked on the last episode. This isn't something that, that I can do alone. And I'm not saying that, you know, I'm, I am by any means, but it's going to take all of us, you know, and it's not just those of us that are in public safety that have to help with doing this. It's the general public as well. You know, there's a lot of agencies right now that are compiling these statistics that are running these tests. Um, there was a couple that I came across and it was two, I believe they were psychiatrists. They may have been psychologists, but both of those were running two different types of, of training programs or I say training programs, they were running um, uh, just programs in general on helping those in public safety with coping and dealing and moving forward and improving their mental health. And, you know, they're not in public safety. You know, mental health is their job. But they're getting funding either from the federal government or from private sources or whatever the case is to do this research. They're doing this research on, on those of us in public safety to try to help us be able to be better at our jobs by being better ourselves. And you know, like you guys have heard me say before, it's okay to not be okay. And that's what people are starting to realize, but it's not going to continue if we don't keep pushing it. If we don't keep trying to bring a face to these things and a voice to these things to try to help save those of us in this job from developing these poor behavioral uh, health conditions before we fall victim to suicide um, or any of these other aspects, you know, we have to keep pushing. We have to keep trying. As a subculture in ourselves, we've got to do it. But in general, in public safety, or not in public safety, but in general, with the general populace, we've got to all keep trying. We've got to all be supportive of it. And it's because we expect so much from this 1.4%. There's so much expected of this 1.4%. 
it's it's a valuable resource. Why would we not? Why would why would we not try to take care of it? it? Makes absolutely no sense to not try to help it, to not try to make it better. You know, you guys go and buy a brand new car. You don't just let it sit out in the driveway and turn to crap and and look like crap. You're out there polishing it. You're out there washing it, polishing it, vacuuming it out. You're doing all these things to keep that car looking nice. You know, the same with a house. You go get you a new house or in a new apartment or whatever the case is. You're doing things to keep those things nice because you want them to last. You want them to be around for a while. It's the same with our public safety community. Okay. It's the same. If we want to keep these individuals around, if we want to keep them looking good and working and being proficient and smooth and, and doing the things that we want them to do and that we ask of them, we have to keep working on it. We have to keep trying to make it better. We have to keep trying to keep it up. You know, talking on cars because I, I, I do mess with cars. If you're working, if you're driving a car, you never change the oil, you never check the tire pressure, you never check this, that, and the other, that car is going to break down on you. You know, so you're you're going to be doing your oil changes or someone's going to be doing your oil changes ever so often. Someone's going to be checking the tire pressure. Someone's going to be doing the maintenance on your car, the preventative maintenance on your car. Um, you know, that's because you want it to keep working like it's supposed to. Public safety is no different. You know, in general, people are no different, but in public safety, it's no different. If you want to keep the machine working right and you want the machine to do the things that you want it to do, you got to take care of it. You got to keep it up. You got to do the, the preventative maintenance. You got to make the maintenance. You got you got to do these things if you want it to happen. It's no different. And that's what we're trying to do here. So jumping back into some of this. Suicide risks. How how do you how do you notice or pick up? on the fact that someone is or may be considering committing suicide. Well, there's a bunch of different ways, but some of the some of the research that, that I looked at gave us some gave some help in that. Increased uses of alcohol or drugs. And by drugs it doesn't necessarily mean you you know you find your coworker, you know, snorting a line uh, you know, off the trunk of their car or whatever the case is. It could be just sleeping meds. It could be um uh, caffeine pills it could be any number of things that that people are that are people have started increasing their use of. You know, you you find out that on your off days, your coworker has gone from having an occasional drink to getting blackout drunk almost every day off. That's a sign. You know, you you've got a coworker that's like, oh man, I'm I'm up to taking five melatonin a night and try to get some sleep. That's a sign that something's going on. Um. Acting reckless. You see these individuals start doing things that they wouldn't normally do, things that can get them hurt or get them killed. You know, they they increase this. By nature, our jobs are often enough high risk. But you're start you're starting to see these individuals do things that they wouldn't normally do. You know, you know, you're in the fire department and all of a sudden you're watching one of your coworkers. I don't know, charging into a burning building without making sure, you know, the proper equipment was set up and the proper measures were taken before you before you enter that building. Um, you know, corrections, you got an individual that's running into a a fight between inmates without making sure they had backup and, you know, and protective gear in place and things like that. You know, you just all these all these reckless actions are starting to come in. And you notice these things. That, that's a possible sign that that you've got someone that's that's you know at a higher risk of suicide, or at least at bare minimum, a higher risk of having some mental health thing going on. Withdrawing from activities, you know, the ones you're close to, all of a sudden they stop wanting to hang out, whether it's you know on the job, whether it's out of the job, whether it's you know during during off duty hours. They stop wanting to hang out or you find out that they're not going to the gym as much anymore. Um, they quit going to the gym. Um, you know, they're, they're not going to the baseball games. They're not doing this, all of these things that they did that they enjoyed doing. They've stopped doing, or they're doing less. Um, this is a sign of depression as well, guys, that, you know, that's one of the, the signs of depression is people starting to withdraw from the activities they normally enjoyed. 
and, and that, that's the same here, you know, when you see a coworker that's starting to withdraw from the things that they used to enjoy, whether it was uh, something they did as an individual or whether it was something they did with a group of people. They, you know, maybe you all go out on Tuesdays for Taki to Taco Tuesdays or meet up at a sports bar on Thursdays for a trivia night or something like that um, or a karaoke thing. I must not my thing, but whatever. Um, but they're starting to withdraw from these things that bring them happiness, that bring them joy, that help them relax and, and feel, um, you know, a little less stressed. They start withdrawing from these things and, and you start seeing a lot less of them. That's a sign. That's something you need to pay attention to, especially if you've got any of these other signs. That's something to pick up on. You've got something you, you very likely have got something going on with your with your friend, with your coworker. Um, if you're starting to see these signs. Doesn't necessarily mean it's 100%. It could just be a little rough spot they're going through and it's nothing major. Um, but keep an eye out for it. You know, these are just some signs you can be looking for. They start isolating from friends and family. So just like I said, withdrawing from activities. You know, they're not they're not spending as much time with their family. They're not um, going around their friends that they normally do. Um, you know, they start breaking plans. You know, you, you, you had a plan to go hiking, camping, or to a theme park or whatever the case may have been. And they start withdrawing from that and start isolating themselves. Oh, no, I've just kind of been sitting around the house, not really doing much of anything, blah, 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 blah. You know, this this could be a sign that this individual's got something going on, something that may be worth paying attention to, to start having that uncomfortable, that uncomfortable conversation that we talked about last show. Start having that uncomfortable conversation. Hey, you good? You know, what's, what's going on? You know, we really miss you kind of being around, blah, 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 blah. It may be worth having that conversation or at least start thinking about having that conversation, especially again, like if you're seeing some of these other some of these other signs. They're sleeping too much or too little, you know, hey, what you do on your day off? I man, after shift, I went home and I crashed. I slept. I got up, you know, I, I went to sleep at, at you know, 6 a.m. And I woke up at about 530 after in the afternoon, got me something quick to eat, went and laid back down and slept some more. Well, now all of a sudden, when you start asking them more and more on their days off, on their when their duty days, you know, hey, what you do on your day off? Ah, I slept, I slept, I slept. Twenty hours of sleep, you good? You, you sure? You, you, you've been sleeping a whole lot, you know? Or the individual that just seems always tired. Ah, I'm just not sleeping. What's going on? What's going on? What? Why ain't you sleeping? Ah, I don't know. Well, I mean, what, what's changed? You know, what's what's changed in your life? What what's got you going on? You 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 anxious about something? You you got some, you dealing with something? You know, start having these these uncomfortable conversations. If you're seeing these signs, it's worth it. You know, be looking for them. Um, one of the big ones as far as a suicide risk is if they start telling people goodbye. If they start going to the people they know and saying goodbye or giving away their possessions. You know, the, these are things that that are extreme, extreme uh, risk factors that that you need to definitely focus on. You know, if you're sitting there having a conversation, you know, I really appreciated our friendship and everything. And um, just I just appreciated it all. All right, dude. Now, don't 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 answer it like that. Look at him like you good. Kind of sounds like you're telling me bye or something. What's going on? You know, or if they go, hey, I've got this collection of of whatever, you know, you interested in. If it's something you knew that was a prized possession to them in the past, now all of a sudden they're just trying to give it to you. You know, maybe by itself it's nothing, but think about it at least. Look around, you know, see if you notice any of these other signs that your friend or your coworker is, you know, possibly going through some things. You know, maybe they're getting put through the ringer, running through the gauntlet themselves, and they're given the signs, but we're not picking up on it. And guys, I'm going to tell you from personal experience, seeing the signs after the fact, after something has happened to an individual, seeing those signs after the fact is a horrible feeling, especially when it comes to suicide, because you're already going to be left with all the questions. You're already going to be sitting there thinking, what could I have done? How did I miss it? Is there anything I could have done to have changed it? I should have known better. I should have did something, blah, 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 blah. You're going to go through all these different scenarios. We're, we're getting that information out there. We're trying to get that education 
on an individual basis now so that we can spot these things. So we can stop having these questions because we're stopping the individuals from doing it. We're stopping and helping these individuals get the help they need so that they can enjoy their life, so that they can come back and and be just as much of the public safety community as they always were. We have to. You know, we've got to start doing this. We lose too many of us. Another sign to look for is aggression. So all of a sudden, someone that was, you know, fairly passive person, all of a sudden now starts getting more aggressive. Doesn't have to be physical. It could be verbal. You know, they they start showing signs of aggression when there's, you know, simple confrontation between employees or coworkers, you know, um, just something as simple as is you know this person used to be understanding calm this that and the other now all of a sudden they're you know they're like a match they're 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 quick to fire off these are things that that you need to pick up on these are things you need to see um these are all signs that that something could be going on and causing that person some kind of mental health stress or that they may be in the early stages or going deeper into a behavioral health condition that, that's bad. Um, some other signs to look for. Depression. Do they seem more depressed? Um, do they have a loss of interest in things? Are they showing that aggression? Do they seem more irritable? Um, you know, a lot of times people can kind of come off as just being in a bad mood all the time. You know, if this is somebody that wasn't in a bad mood or that was a fairly happy person, and all of a sudden they seem like you're always in a bad mood, what's going on? You know, what they got going on in their lives that's changed their their mood? You know, if there's somebody that was outgoing and, and a, a, a social butterfly in essence, and now all of a sudden, you know, it's hard to even get five seconds in with them to have a conversation, could be a sign, you know, could be a sign that they've got something going on that needs some attention. And it's at least worth it on your behalf to speak up. Humiliation or anxiety. You know, if they feel humiliated by certain things in their life or they're constantly anxious, you know, these are signs. You know, these are things to watch out for. Um, one of the things that was noted was vocalizing. And, and these are going to seem kind of duh -huh at first. Like, well, of course, if they say that I need to be concerned about it. But when you hear these phrases i want you to or you hear these these generalized phrases i want you to think back in your communications or your conversations with your coworkers, with your friends and tell me if any of these could have applied you know see if it sparked something in your mind that maybe this individual has been dealing with something and you didn't notice it because it didn't happen back to back to back or they didn't come out and say hey i'm thinking about killing myself or god all i want to do is just freaking get drunk all the time so obviously if they vocalize killing themselves, killing themselves, again, duh, -huh. you know, obviously if you hear someone say they want to kill themselves, that's, that's going to be a sign, but having no reason to live, ah, it's not worth it, man. I, I ain't no sense of me even being around anymore, especially if they're in a depressive state at the time that they make that statement. The spidey senses need to start tingling. Okay. Again, seems duh, huh? How simple of a conversation can it be that that generalization can be given in a subtle manner? Pay attention to what's being said. Actually listen to, to what your coworkers and, and these, these uh, subordinates and so on and so forth are saying. You know, it could be subtle, but it could be there. They could be telling you that they've got no reason to live. You know, their spouse left them, their, their children don't want anything else to do with them or their mom and dad or their friends or whatever the case may be, you know, something's changed. Now, all of a sudden, they've got no reason to live. Seems duh hub, but sometimes that statement, even the, the killing themselves statement, sometimes it's not so straightforward. Sometimes it's a subtle implication and they're putting it out there as a, as a, a litmus test on how you're going to respond so they know whether or not to open up to you. Pay attention to it. Think back over the conversations you've had and whether or not, you know, someone that you deal with on a regular basis or even on, a, on an occasional basis, maybe going through some of this stuff. They feel like they're being a burden to others. Guys, I'm going to go ahead and tell you that this one, at least in my opinion, from my experience, is 
one to listen for, but don't take it on its surface. You know, being a burden to others. I myself, you know, like we talked in the past, the, the last episode, I didn't open up to a bunch of people about what was going on with me. I was sad about losing my brother and, and, and my my uncle and my uh, close friend. I was sad about those things, but I didn't open up to people about it because I didn't want to be a burden to them. You know, I didn't want them to think, oh my God, now I've got him over here and I don't want to deal with it, so on and so forth. In reality, very likely would have not have been a burden, but that was the thought process. I didn't want to vocalize it to individuals because I didn't want to be a burden to them. That was at least one of the thoughts that went through my head when dealing with all that. So I wasn't thinking about suicide or anything like that, but I was obviously going through something. I was going through mourning. I was going through sadness over these things that have occurred in my life. And that was how I felt. I felt like by telling anyone else what was going on with me, that I was going to be a burden, you know? And of course, after the fact that, oh, you don't ever think that you need to talk to me, so on and so forth. But it's hard to see that when you're in that moment. You know, when you're in that moment of, of feeling like you're a burden to people, that's that's a problem. And if you look at individuals that are going through things even worse than what I did, or they're handling it a lot worse than what I did, that's a statement that can be a, a sign that there's something more serious going on. You know, maybe it's not just sadness. Maybe it's just not, maybe it's not just mourning. Um, maybe it's a, you know, a serious mental health condition that's, that's deteriorating rapidly. Um, so, so pay attention to that one. Don't take it for, for, don't take it for, you know, granted by any means, but also just keep in mind that, that there are other things that could be attached to it that maybe are not revolving around the deepest portions and darkest portions of that. And I kind of feel like my own thoughts on the stigma of mental health and public safety kind of come out on that one. So there you go. You know, it happens just that easy. Hey guys, got to jump in here real quick. I hope you're enjoying the content. However, we have reached the end of this particular part and we'll pick it back up on the next one. Thanks for joining me. See you on the next one.